am I going to tell this story? So um, let me start this way. On July um, 8th of 2014, I found myself sitting in a courtroom. Uh, I'd been in a relationship that was a long-term relationship. It was 23 years. 8,522 days <laughs> since the first date. I know that for a reason. Because as I sat in that courtroom, I was thinking about how quickly my marriage was dissolved. Because I didn't fight that day. Because I've been fighting for 23 years for my relationship. And I came to a point when I realized that if I didn't fight anymore, I wouldn't have a relationship. So I knew that it was 8,520 two days from the time that I first danced with my wife to the point where my relationship dissolved like that because I didn't fight. Stunning actually. 8,522 days. 6,337 days since we've been married. I once got in my car when I was in the military and rode seven hours from Virginia up to wish my wife, ex-wife, happy birthday. Got in my car and drove back seven hours. I remember her laying on my lap and me stroking the first gray hair she ever had. And my relationship was over like that. It shook me. We left the courtroom. I don't actually really remember leaving the courtroom. I kind of remember standing at the elevator, and the next thing I remember is standing outside the courtroom, the courthouse. And then somehow that pavement between us grew, and the people between us grew, and I was in my car. And the next thing I remember was being in my house. And I wanted to go to sleep. But we all know that when you want to go to sleep, you can't go to sleep. <laughs> It works that way no matter what the reason is. And so I decided that uh, maybe I would go down to my refrigerator. So I'm standing at the refrigerator, and I'm holding the handle of the refrigerator, and I'm hoping there's some alcohol in there. And I think to myself this crazy thought. I'm like, so this is how it begins. This is how you become an alcoholic. <laughs> But I don't have any alcohol in the refrigerator. I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> um, so I decide that I'm going to do something that I know works. I go back upstairs. First, I take off my ring. It's the last time I ever took it off. I never took off my ring. And the whole time, the whole 6,337 days, I never took off that ring. I sat it down, and I never saw it again. I don't even know how it disappeared. And I go upstairs, and I get down on my knees. I can have a conversation. And the conversation ends kind of in a funny way. I said, God, after all this stuff, I said, I, said, I don't want to talk to a woman for about two years. I can't handle it. But then I remember something that somebody once said to me about blocking your blessing. And so I said, but if you have a different plan, <laughs> he had a different plan. A couple of months later, I'm on Facebook. Anybody who knows me knows I'm on Facebook a lot. Um, I start noticing that this person is quickly liking everything I put on Facebook. And it becomes quite obvious. So uh, I decide we should talk. And so through a series of events, she comes over. I'm a photographer in my spare time. She comes over, and I'm supposed to be taking her picture. And we start a conversation. Six hours later, she says to me, and I didn't know it was six hours later. I thought it was like 40 minutes. <laughs> she says to me, can I use your restroom? I said, sure. And I went in. I looked at the clock, and it was about I don't know, 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. 
and I was stunned. And when she's leaving, I'm thinking, wow, that was a long conversation. But what I'm also realizing is, for the first time, I actually, I didn't hear the words. I was just in this conversation. I actually heard her voice. And I have to tell you, um, it was like magic. Like it, it hit me, and it went through my spine, and it made me feel something. And then she was leaving, and she stepped off the porch, and I was like, I don't know what to do, because I've been out of the dating pool for a long time. <laughs> And I don't know to hug her, to kiss her, what you do. <laughs> and she steps down, and she's obviously shorter than me, and so it's awkward. She turns to hug me. It's weird. And I'm like, this woman's never, <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever. She's just. But I called her up and asked her for a date. And we went on a date, and six hours later, we got kicked out of the restaurant. And I said, there's something here. You know, maybe my two, maybe, 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 I don't know. And so a relationship began. And we're dating, and we're having a good time. And most of our conversations are very long conversations about people I don't know, that I have no reason to care about. And yet, I'm engrossed in these conversations. So the relationship grows. And at one point, we start talking about, what if someday we get to, we, we're together and we have children? And she asked me the question, what would you name your kid? And I never thought about the possibility of having a son, right? I just knew the name was Imani. I don't know why I knew the name was Imani. And so we had this conversation over and over, and it kept being the name Imani. And so I went and I said, maybe I should figure out what this name even might mean. And when I looked up the name Imani, I found out the name means faith. And I thought that was interesting because it's my faith that allowed me to meet that woman. And so I put that in my memory bank. And that's how she gets the name Imani. The second name is Harriet. Now, another July, another Tuesday, similar day, overcast day. I was supposed to be going, this is July of 2012, not 2014. I was supposed to be going to Boston to give a speech. I woke up that morning. Something said, don't go, to, don't go to Boston. Don't give that speech. So I stayed home. My mother was supposed to be having a rather routine surgery. Um, I got a call around 4 o'clock. When my phone rang, I started putting on my shoes. I live in New Haven, Connecticut. She was out in Long Island, um, probably an hour and 40 minute trip. I was in her room in about 47 minutes. But it still wasn't fast enough. And my mother lay there with the tube sticking out of her mouth. My world crumbled. And then the doctors came and they said, <coughs> they said to us that um, we could take all the time we wanted to, but somebody had to make the decision to turn the machine off. It wasn't somebody with me that had to make that decision. And I realized that my world hadn't crumbled until the point at which I turned off the machine. So <laughs> my brother and sister, um, they were devastated. And um, that meant that a lot of stuff that we are supposed to do for our mom as she passes fell to me, including writing the obituary. So I sat down to write her obituary. And I started thinking about my mother as I'm writing. And I rem remember something. Remember, the, my mother was a singer. I remember the only time we sang together, and there's a reason for that, because I can't sing. <laughs> <sighs> no, I can't. Um, and I remember we sang a song, and I remembered something I had forgotten, that my mother said, 
at my funeral, I want you to sing the song. I have no idea why my mother wanted me to sing a song at her funeral. Um, so I, st I said to myself, I have to, have to kind of honor that. So I stood up at the funeral. I put a piece of paper in my jacket. Not that I didn't know the song, but you know, mother's funeral. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be hurting. And I start off, well, I have the piece of paper. And I'm, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary. And there were so many tears in my eyes, I couldn't even read the paper. And so I just tried to say the words. And then I got to the part where it goes, but he knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes, they can't see. And I struggled all the way through that song, but I just remember that part of the song. And I said to myself, my mother raised me in church. She raised me to believe every word in that song. And I said to myself, that's how I have to, to live. So when people met me after that, I was struggling. It was everybody was struggling. They were stunned that it didn't seem like I was pretending that I was OK. Because I kept saying to myself, there must be some reason why my mother was taken. And she was so young, she hadn't even hit 60 yet. And so as I'm trying to figure out where the ground is, I start thinking about conversations I've had with my mother and the things I remember. And I remember one conversation with my mother about her name. And my mother's name was Armenta. She was the child of Harriet, who was the child of Armenta. That doesn't immediately mean anything to anybody. Some people maybe, but most people know. There's a woman named Armenta Ross that we don't commonly think of as Armenta Ross. And Armenta Ross uh, got married to a guy with the last name Tubman and started using her last name, her middle name, Harriet. And so my mother recognized that for some reason in her family, there was a connection to that name, Araminta and Harriet. And what my mother told me one day when I was sitting there talking to her was that what she really wanted to do was do the work that Harriet had done, the work of going back. And unfortunately, at that moment, I didn't know what to tell her. Because what my mother told me, in addition to the fact that she wanted to do that work, was that she hadn't been able to do anything of importance. So my mother, she was like a superhero to me. And she's crying, and she's telling me she's not sure her life was worth anything. So my mother didn't get to do that work. But she raised me. And I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing without my mother. There was a time where I believed that, you know, I worked really hard and I created a lot of this stuff myself, but I know now that like my mother's name has its origins in my grandmother's name, and that name has its origin in my great-grandmother's name. My story, my ability to do the work that I do has its origin in my mother. And if I had another moment, I'd tell her that you had done the work of going back because you empowered me to do that work. And so how my daughter gets her second name, Harriet, is because I honor my mother by giving her the name Harriet. And so that's how she becomes Monty Harriet, because I believe that names have meaning and power. And I think it's the least that I can do. Now, I could have named her Tuesday in July, because <laughs> they're just as important to this story. <laughs> But that's how my daughter gets her name. <laughs>